You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. God's patience was used as an excuse to send more rather than to repent. They didn't repent. Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about that in verses 3 to 8. He says, but you suppose that so man when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Our God is exceedingly patient with us. On your best day, you cannot match the patience of God. But what are you going to do with the patience God gives you? You could go on sinning, reasoning that God will go on being patient with you. Or you could recognize that God's patience and loving kindness is there to bring you to repentance and back into right relationship with Him. In today's message, Pastor Ken is going to show you the ultimate end of those who abuse the patience of God. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter 18 as he continues his message, What City Do You Live In? You ever met people who say they're believers and you sit there and go, but why are you doing that job? You know? I was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. And I'd run into people and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. Well, where do you work? Well, I work down at Caesars Palace. I'm a dealer. Why do you have that job? I mean, that, that's it, it's just a question. I know that's an issue that the churches there who are, deal with people who come to Christ and they have to disciple them and eventually they go, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. You know, but they, you gotta, you got to take them there. You have to bring them there and let them grow in the Lord. But there are people who make this choice. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 to 16, this is part of the, 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 those in faith. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. That's what we are. We're not earth dwellers. Remember, this is all earth dweller, earth dweller, earth dweller. Believers aren't earth dwellers. This is not our home. We don't live here. We're aliens. Those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. We're seeking what the Lord has for us. That's the city we're looking for. We're looking for the new Jerusalem. You know, all of us as believers already are on the citizenship papers of New Jerusalem, okay? I don't know what street we're going to live on, but I mean, I, but we already have citizenship papers there, thanks to what Jesus did on the cross. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had an opportunity to return, talking about Abraham. But as it is, they desire a better country, and that's a heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. Jeremiah talks about this moment too in chapter 51, verse 6. He's not talking about the folks who are, in, who are going to be held captive in Babylon as a result of the captivity. He's talking about this moment. Flee from the midst of Babylon and each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. Very clear. For whatever reason, there are some Jews there, there are some believers there, whether they're captive or whether they're being held to be put to death, or they're there working, we don't know. But the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara, says these are God's people and they're in a place where they shouldn't be and it's ripe for destruction. Okay? I mean, that's just the way it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 is the New Testament warning for us not to go to the wrong town. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with dark? What harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? This is not just, I mean, I, when I grew up, everybody used that. Oh, don't marry an unbeliever. Don't marry. A, uh, yeah, I got that. I saw it every day. Dad did not know the Lord. Mom did. I lived in it. Okay, I knew what was going on. So, but it also means other things. I've seen people who are believers who become partners in business with people who aren't believers. Well, that's a problem because the believer wants to take the profit, some of the profit that they're going to donate and give it to the Lord, do it to the Lord's work someplace, whereas the one who is not a believer might want to use it to uh, throw a, a party or buy a, 
a space where he can entertain guests at uh, at the Dolphins games. I don't know why you want to do that now, but you know, unless you want to see them lose, but uh, you know, it, it, it's that kind of thing. It's easy to be sucked in. It really is. I mean, if you're in business, and I've been in business for a long, long time, it's a simple. You look at it and say, "Oh, it's a simple business partnership. It's not a big deal." Is the person you're in business with a believer? I think of. Uh, a gentleman by the na- last name of Letourneau who invented a bunch, made up, all, he's an engineer, he made a lot of tractors, was really good in mining equipment, and because he owned his company and was, there was nobody else involved in it, he could give to the Lord. And by the time he passed away, 90% of the profits of his business were going to the Lord. He didn't need it. But another example would be not needing the money. The guy who's the coach of the basketball team that happened to win the national championship this last year was offered a huge promotion and $40 million and said, I don't need it. The Lord's given me everything I need. I've been blessed beyond, I've been blessed like I can't believe. I don't need it. Use it someplace else. And, but as believers, we have that freedom. But if all of a sudden you're in a business partnership with someone who's not, well, I don't, do you have that freedom anymore? You know, I mean, it's it's easy to be sucked in. I worked as I worked as a consultant for a while, and you're part of the firm. But if you are offered a partnership, all of a sudden you're in a partnership with people who aren't believers. Do I want to do that? Well, you get paid a lot of money, and yeah, but then you find yourself compromising on this assignment or that. I mean, you're ethical today, but will you be ethical tomorrow? I, it just things things happen. Your partner's a businessman looking for a good business opportunity. They're going to look wherever they can. And all of a sudden you find yourself supporting and being involved in a business that happens to also sell not medical marijuana, but marijuana for the purpose of recreational use in in the state of California or Oregon. Legal in that state, but is that something that a Christian should be involved in? Probably not. I mean, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about that. The appeal of salary and prestige attracts a lot of people today, but it's also going to be a problem then. So you've just gone through three and a half years of being persecuted, and this guy's come into power, and he's going to build this new city out in the middle of the desert south of Baghdad. And he's crazy, but he's going to pay a lot of money for me to be a construction engineer, so I'll go be a construction engineer for him. And since I'm working for this firm, and I, they'll, they'll pay me, and they'll They'll make sure I get fed and all that because I have a skill that they have to use and I won't have to take the mark. And now they're there in Babylon and the Lord's saying, get out of town. It's going to be a problem. I mean, but, and they're going to, I've heard this too, but I'm being a witness. Okay, but how's that going for you? Remember Lot's wife, okay? That's, that's about all I can say. In Luke 17, 32. Uh, just remember her. She looked back. And when he went and told his son-in-law, his son-in-law thought he was joking. He had sunk compromised so much to that point that nobody believed him anymore. So, yeah, great witness. So as we saw in Jeremiah 51, 9, Babylon's ripe for judgment. We applied healing to Babylon. She was not healed. Forsake her. Let each of us go to his own country. For her judgment has reached to heaven and towers up to the very sky. Babylon as a city system, as the city of man, has a long history. It's killed millions and millions of people. It's led millions astray. There have been millions of believers over the last several thousand years who ceased being believers or never became believers because they got tied up in the things of the world and they started worshiping money. It's a center of stumbling blocks. And Jesus warns what happens to people who become stumbling blocks in Mark 9, 42. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it'd be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he'd been cast in the sea. By the way, when we get to verse 21 of chapter 18, a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea saying, so will Babylon be thrown down. Isn't that interesting? God means what he says and says what he means. 
Now recall that when Nimrod was having that tower built, he, a stated goal was, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach to heaven and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we'll be scattered abroad. So what we're seeing here in chapter 18 is the only thing that's reached into heaven, and we saw it in Jeremiah too, is sin. That's the only thing that's, that's there. That's the only thing that's reached up. In the Greek it actually says it's been glued one on top of another, on top of another, on top of another, is, is kind of what the, the picture is. God's patience was used as an excuse to sin more rather than to repent. And they didn't repent. Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about that in verses 3 to 8. He says, but you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. And that's what we're seeing here in chapter 18. Wrath and then indignation. I like what Dr. McGee says. He says, Babylon has a long history of accumulated sin. When you look at the thousands of years of the city of man, yeah, oh yeah, God has that record. It's one of the oldest cities in the history of mankind, and it's referenced, as we said, over 200 times in the Bible. Jerusalem's the only other city that's mentioned more. But judgment breaks like a flood, and it is going to be delayed, but it's going to happen. And it'll happen in a day for Babylon. Verses 6 to 8 of Revelation 18 says, Pay her back, even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds in the cup which she has mixed. Mix twice as much for her to the degree that she's glorified herself and lives sensually to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, I'm not a widow, and I'll never see mourning. For this reason, and in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she'll be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. Here's what it says in Jeremiah about that same event. Jeremiah 50, verses 1 to 10. The word which the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, through Jeremiah the prophet. Declare and proclaim among the nations. Proclaim it and lift up a standard. Do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured. Bel has been put to shame. Marduk has been shattered. Her images have been put to shame. Her idols have been shattered. A nation has come up against her out of the north. Every, I, I got taught, oh yeah, that was the Medes and the Persians. And When you read on, there's more to it. A nation has come up out of the north and it'll make her land an object of horror. And there'll be no inhabitant in it. That didn't happen as a result of the Medes and the Persians. They just took over. Both man and beast have wandered off. They've gone away. In those days and at that time, that's Old Testament is for saying end of the age. Declares the Lord, the, son of Israel, the sons of Israel will come, both they and the sons of Judah as well. They'll go along weeping as they go, and it will be the Lord their God they will seek. They will ask for the way to Zion, turning their faces in its direction. They will come that they may join themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that, they will, not be for, that will not be forgotten. Okay, so they're talking about the end of the age. My people have become lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They've made them turn aside on the mountains. They've gone along from the mountain to hill and have forgotten their resting place. All who came upon them have devoured them, and their adversaries have said, We're not guilty, inasmuch as they've sinned against the Lord, who's the habitation of the righteous, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Wander away from the midst of Babylon and go forth from the land of the Chaldeans. Be also like the male goats at the head of the flock. For behold... I'm going to arouse and bring up against Babylon a horde of great nations from the land of the north. This is not the Medes and the Persians. And they will draw up their battle lines against her. From there she will be taken captive. Their arrows will be like an expert warrior who does not return empty-handed. Chaldea will become plunder, and all who plunder her will have enough, declares the Lord. Now, I want to back up and take a look at a sentence there. Their arrows, 
will be like an expert warrior. How can an arrow be like an expert warrior? By the way, that's not the word for arrow. The Hebrew there actually means javelin, something that you throw long, okay? And how can it be, how can a, an instrument be an expert warrior? It can't, unless it's a guided missile. And it does not return empty-handed. So what we have here in the Old Testament is language that seems to be indicating that it's going to be like a guided missile that doesn't return empty-handed, whatever is happening here at the end of the age. Because the words that are used are not the typical words. That, there's a different word in the Hebrew for arrow. That's not used here. And how can an arrow be an expert warrior? I don't know of any arrow that's an expert warrior. It's just, a, it's just an arrow, okay? You shoot it, it hits the target, you go pick it up, come back. It's just, that's it. Unless it's a guided arrow, but I have to guide it. But if it's a missile, you never know. Anyway, Daniel 11, 44 and 45 says the same thing. Rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, disturb the beast, and he'll go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Yeah, all the armies of the world have been drawn to Israel, okay, at this point. Yes, the beast has been the unchallenged ruler of the world for almost three and a half years. But life has not been happy amongst all his minions, as you can tell by what it says in the scripture. Remember, the powers that are in behind all of the things in the world, these fallen divine beings, they're all rebels. And they have no problem fighting against each other, just like they did in the Old Testament, constantly. So they're going to lead, an un they're, some of them are going to lead a rebellion against the un unholy trinity and destroy Babylon. They're going to be from the north, they're going to be from the east. Daniel says north and east. Jeremiah says hordes from the north. Anytime I read hordes, I'm thinking, oh, Russians. I don't know. It just it says hordes from the north. All we know is the beast left town to take down the, the roadblocks to global domination, Jerusalem, and while he's busy doing that, his town's destroyed like that. Revelation 12, 14 to 17, I'll let you read that on your own. It talks about why he's been unable to destroy the Jews because the land's actually participating in keeping him away. But here in Revelation 18, 6, it appears that instructions are now being provided to those forces that will be fulfilling what it is that God has in store for Babylon. These commands are from the same voice, God's voice, in heaven that told his people, get out, and in the Greek, He's using words that are imperatives. He says, pay back and give back. He's commanding them to do something. Just as he used the beast to take care of the religious Babylon, he's using other military powers that are going to, he's going to wind up destroying later at, the, at Armageddon, but he's going to use them as well. Some say it's the angel that John saw. That's not. That's not the case. This is payback as she's given, repay her her deeds, do to her as she's done. It, basically, this is a scriptural emphasis on the doctrine of reward and punishment. What you did, God's going to do to you. Literally, they're going to pay back Babylon twice for what Babylon has done. I love what it says in the, in the Greek. Render to her as also she did render to you and double to her doubles according to her works in the cup that she did mingle, mingle to her double. That's literal translation from the Greek, okay? What it means is literally do a double measure in full. It doesn't mean retribution double in severity. It just has the sense that punishment will be an exact equivalent to the offense. And, in the, and that's just how they're, they're saying it in the Greek. It's just called a double, okay? So verse 7 again of chapter 18, to the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensually to the same degree, give her torment and mourning. She says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I'm not a widow and will never see mourning. But we clearly see now where the spirit of Laodicea is from. Okay? It's revealed to us in chapter 3. It comes again. The source of all false religion apostasy is from hell. That's where it's from. I have Revelation 3.17 there for you to take a look at. But the law of retribution that's indicated here in verse 7 is the standard of the judgment that's being compared to her luxurious living. She was given to self-glorification. In other words, Babylon was. The expression actually in, in the Greek is she lived deliciously. 
I don't know why they didn't translate it like that. I've got it. I think that's pretty good. But it means to be wanton or to revel and comes from the word hard-headed or strong. Babylon's sin against God is to be rewarded with torment and sorrow. The word torment actually reveals, re- refers to trial by torture. What has Babylon been doing to believers? Torturing them. God's going to give them the same. Her wishful thinking in which she said, I sit as a queen, I'm no widow. Yeah, you're going to be destroyed overnight. Overnight. Just like that. In three and a half years, the attitude has become, for those who are in power, that nothing can upset this. Nothing. They're invisible, bulletproof. Nobody can do anything to them. They believe that the economic system is is set up with all commerce and trade, that nothing will ever happen to it. It's the same arrogance that you see in the comments of the Laodicean church. I'm rich and don't need anything. It's this attitude that God has this message for them in verse 8. For this reason, in one day, her plagues will come, pestilence, mourning, and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For the Lord God who judges her is strong. The final destruction of the world system and this world capital, which they think is invulnerable, it'll happen in a day, in a day, just like that. We'll take a look at some of the looky-loos, the folks who are seeing it all happen and what they see next week. But, you know, when judgment falls in Genesis 7 with the flood, Noah and his family go in, God closes the door, and bam, judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, single day, leveled. As soon as Lot is out of there, it's destroyed. I mean, in Genesis 19, the angel said, I can't do anything until you're out of here. But he did it that day. That day. When it's time for judgment to take place, God does not delay. He takes action. So because of this reason, because of her arrogance, because of the spirit of Babylon... There's no security. It's going to be judged overnight. So overnight, the world empire that has ruled the planet for three and a half years, that has done, that has killed billions of people, is destroyed. Just like that. But the beast is in Israel. He's trying to take down the Jews. He's trying to do his final solution. There's more to that. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But next we're going to take a look at the rest of chapter 18. There's lamentations. And there's three groups that actually go see this and they're going, oh, this is terrible. But they're not sad to see it go. They're, sad. they're all sad for the same reason. I, don't, I won't make money anymore. That's really a strange reason to be sad about something. But that shows you the mindset of man and where man is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for showing us in your scriptures that there's a clear choice for us to make all the time. What city do we want to live in? Do we want to be believers and stand for you, or do we want to compromise and move closer and closer and closer to Babylon, closer to Sodom, or or even in Lot's case, wind up being a ruler in town? Lord, help us to be all about serving you and going to the place that you want us to be. Help us not to compromise. Help us not to compromise your message, not to compromise what it is you've done in our lives. Help us to stand for you, to understand also, Lord, that that may mean persecution, but at the same time, help us to be faithful to you and what it is that you've called us to do. Thank you for this time in your word, Lord, and we just once again claim the promise of the blessing that you promised back in chapter 1. Thank you, Lord. Just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message was in the book of Revelation. Pastor Ken has been teaching from this prophetic book here on the Unsafe Bible. You hear often about people trying to predict the end of the world or referring to some kind of apocalyptic event. But the truth is, the real apocalypse or revelation of Jesus Christ is something unlike anything else. If you know Jesus, you see these events as something that God will bring about to eventually restore things to how they were meant to be. If you view God as an enemy, you would naturally perceive the events in Revelation as some foreign enemy seeking to wreak havoc on the world and bring it to ruin. So what's the truth? If you're curious about what we believe and what our core foundation is built on, go to theunsafebible.com to learn more. 
Are you in the Jupiter, Florida area? If so, you're welcome to join us for these types of teachings in person. You'll find ways to contact us on our website so you can learn when and where we meet each week. You can also access more teachings online by going to theunsafebible.com and looking under the media tab. Catch up on any messages you've missed or listen to one you already heard as a refresher. Once again, that's theunsafebible.com. We're so glad you took the time today to hear from God and His Word. Pastor Ken has more to share from the book of Revelation, so don't miss a single edition. In the meantime, continue growing on your own in this very peculiar book of the Bible. And join us again on The Unsafe Bible.